and welcome to today's class where we're going to talk about driving emergencies. We're going to wait a few minutes like we always do, waiting for people to log in. So make sure that you uh, post your name in the comments and also that you text me that you've joined today's session. And at the end of today's session, make sure that you sign out. Okay. Um, I'm going to just wait a few minutes uh, for people to to join. I am still waiting for some of you to hand in uh, the homework from the last class uh, dealing with speed um, and also the thoughts and comments about the video that we watched yesterday. So please get that in to me. So we got Luca here. So remember, leave a comment. There's Natalie. Hello, hello. Hope everybody's having a good week. I just want to remind everybody that this will be our last class for this week. Um, I need a little bit of time to catch up with the presentations, the classes that we're going to have next week. And uh, I guess I'll break the bad news to you right now. If you haven't heard, the governor has just issued a uh, stay-at-home extension. So we will not uh, be in school until May. So that goes beyond our end date. So the remainder of this driver's ed class will be online. So I, as I have said with many classes, make sure that you do your work. This is a participation by uh, worksheets, homework, uh, and tests. So, and leaving comments. So it's really important, uh, that you do this because I can't give you credit. There's like one, maybe two of you that may not uh, be able to finish this session. You're going to have to go into a different session, whether it be another online class or if it's, half online and half back at school when we start, a, start up again in May. Uh, the other thing that we've got to start thinking about is what are we going to do with all the driving? Uh, because it's just backing up right now. So once I'm able to drive with you, and I don't know if I have to wait till May 5th or if we can start a little bit earlier, uh, but if I do start another class, the next class I think is right around the same size as yours which is right around 18, 19 people. So they're going to get in the mix of wanting to drive if they're two weeks, three weeks into the program before we come back to the high school. So we're just going to have to go with what we have for availability. So free up time if you can. We'll be driving before school, uh, probably late in the evening too, uh, just so I can catch up because I'm the only one that's able to do the driving. But the good point is that the class will be done and that will be over. Let's see if this works. So uh, next week we'll go Monday through Thursday at four o'clock. So make sure that you free up time to uh, see the classes that I'm going to provide. As we've done in the past, they're going to probably go about an hour and 15 like our normal class, but because of worksheets that I give you and homework, we're going to count that. So it's going to be more or less closer to a two-hour class because we were missing some time from last week. So we will have had our 30 hours that we need. We're going to go through all the different material that we need to. So let me just take a look. I wrote down a few notes here before we get starting. Is uh, Starting on Monday, we're going to talk about bad weather. So we're going to be talking about ice, rain, sleet, uh, snow, uh, fog, uh, fatigue driving. That will be on Monday. Uh, Tuesday, possibly into Wednesday's class, will be on alcohol and drugs. And then we're going to get into insurance and what to do if you are involved in a crash. And that was part of your reading that you had last night with driving emergencies. So we're going to kind of leave that section today for what we're going to talk about next week. Um, and then the following... Oh, uh, last class next week will be on highway driving with a uh, portion dealing with road rage and the emotions that we have of people that get us upset as we drive and do we get upset at other people in the way that they drive. That will be on Thursday. 
And then the last week of class, we'll be dealing with um, large trucks, motorcycles and pedestrians and road construction areas, how to deal with these people. And by the way, I just saw on Facebook that someone in New Hampshire who was a flag flagger, they were doing road construction apparently yesterday or today, uh, was hit by a drunk driver and passed away. So we'll probably talk about that next week. Our last class is on distracted driving. And then I will review of what is going to happen on the final and what to expect when we do get behind the wheel of the car. And the last class that we have will be a final that I will send to you, but I'm revamping that. It's going to be in the same format that you had with your midterm. So if you were pulling in the 70s, let's kind of bring that up a little bit so you can score above 80. As I said, the first week of class, if you participated, uh, watched all the videos, I mean, stayed online while we were having these sessions, if you did all your work, uh, if you're kind of lingering in the 70s a little bit, you will get extra credit. If you did a video, same thing for extra credit. When we did the seatbelt project, I will uh, help you out too. So let's get into what we're going to cover today. So get out some paper and a pen and let's kind of get into <clears throat> today's discussion. So with driving emergencies, I look at driving emergencies a lot like learning first aid, is that most people get trained in it, but they never have to use it, like CPR, same type of thing, is that when you get a training in one of these courses, they set in place steps that you need to follow, and hopefully if a situation ever arises, that you'll remember enough of the information that you will get through the uh, the situation uh, in the best possible outcomes possible. And that's what we want to do with driving emergencies. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about uh, today is uh, running off the pavement. Th this is something that probably most of you can remember doing when you started driving. Uh, your parents are taking you down a, a rural road or maybe you're in a parking lot and you have to leave the parking lot eventually and you either understeer or oversteer and you find your car going someplace that you don't want it to go and you're going to go off the edge of the pavement. Now, the problem with that is that the more of a drop off that you have, the harder it is to basically come back on. So this is what I want you to write down. And this is one of the most important things that we're going to talk about today is that with all driving emergencies, you want to think about your steering first. All right. Steering is the first thing that you want to think about when you start losing control of your vehicle or a bad situation is arising uh, with your vehicle mechanically. How can I get my car, it's now in my lane, how can I get it off the road safely without interacting with other people and colliding with other cars, causing a crash? So think steering first, then think about braking and um, in some situations, you may even have to accelerate. But for the most part, think steering first, then think about slowing the vehicle down. Maybe some situations accelerated to get to where you're going. So don't panic. Grip the wheel uh, tightly. This is one of the reasons why they tell you uh, always have both hands on the wheel. And if you're grabbing the wheel at 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 8 and 4, it's going to give you a quick turn of the wheel, full revolution of the turning wheel. Uh, if you're only with one hand, you're kind of limited with your range of motion with that one hand. Now the other hand can come on, but it's going to take a split second before it does. And you're not going to be able to handle a, a counter steer. You can do the first turn, but the counter steer is usually done with the other hand. That's going to create a little bit of a problem. So both hands on the steering wheel, ease up on the gas pedal. Don't step on the gas uh, pedal suddenly or the brake pedal uh, suddenly or hard. If you're going to be using the brake par, uh, pedal, think of a slow, gradual uh, slowing down of your vehicle as you're guiding it off the road. Pull over to the side of the road. If it's a bad drop off, stop the vehicle. Think of, about what just happened and then come back on. And when you do come back on, always remember to use your uh, signal. Check your rear view mirror, side view mirror, look over your shoulder and then come out surprisingly that if your car goes off the edge of the road and you're slowing down, if you've got cars behind you, 
you would think that most of them would wait behind you as you come back on slowly. Some cars will try to go around you. So if you're not thinking about signal, mirror check, mirror check, shoulder like you do with a lane change, you could be turning right into a vehicle that's going right by. Now, there are two negative aspects of coming back uh, onto the pavement. One would be an oversteer. So you want to turn the wheel about a quarter of a turn, not a half of a turn, while you're letting the vehicle slow itself down or a little bit of brake as it's slowing down to get back on. And you don't want to cross over that center line because if you, if you turn half of a turn, it's going to shoot you right across. Now, the other negative um, aspect of running off the pavement is that there's too much of a slope of the soft shoulder. So the car is pulling five, six feet off to the right, and you're trying to pull to the left to regain control, but the car is still pulling you, and you just can't regain control, and you go into whatever's coming up. Remember the story that I told you of a student that I had that uh, passed away a couple days before graduation. She ran off the pavement, wasn't able to control the vehicle. That's what happened in her situation. The soft shoulder was, you know, three, four inches of real soft gravel and the tires just got lost and she didn't get any traction to get back on. Um, let's take a look at a video that kind of shows you what we're talking about. Oh, wrong one. That is not the video that I wanted. I have no idea. Um, let's see if this works. Drifting onto the gravel shoulder of a highway can lead to a serious collision. The uneven traction could cause you to lose control of your vehicle and send you into the ditch. In this situation, don't make any quick movements. Making a quick change or abruptly moving back onto the pavement could send your vehicle into the path of oncoming traffic. A head-on collision could occur because of overcorrecting. You should grip the steering wheel firmly and slowly ease off the gas, but do not brake. When you feel you have control of the vehicle, check your mirrors, signal, and ease back onto the highway when safe. If the drop-off to the shoulder is steeper than usual, slow down even more and steer back onto the pavement at an even sharper angle. Okay, uh, that was the video that I originally wanted. Um, that was just mislabeled and came up at the wrong time. Now, another factor of going off the edge of the pavement is that your tire will hit the edge of the pavement, rub up against the side, and then the tire will blow out. So uh, when a tire blows out, you have sudden loss of control of the vehicle. And this is what I want you to write down. So know this for the final. So write this down. It matters what tire blows out. So this is what you need to write down. Whatever front tire blows out, that's the way you're pulling. So a right tire is going to pull you to the soft shoulder. Left front tire is going to pull you to oncoming traffic. Now remember, if you've got multiple lanes on a highway, you may have traffic on the left of you and on the right of you. So when you have a blowout, it's going to pull you into a different lane. So once again, you're trying to steer, trying to stay in your lane. This is why the third bullet, keep your steering wheel held tightly. And when it says steer straight, we're talking about staying centered in your lane. Ease up on the gas pedal. Let the weight of the vehicle slow you down. Only brake when you have control of the vehicle. And then look for a safe place to pull over because you're going to have to uh, change your tire at uh, some point. This is... Um, a video that I wanted to show you about changing a tire.
Now, of course, the word. Oh, there go. So as you can see that uh, the word tire was spelled incorrectly. So this was over in, in Europe, but I thought it was kind of funny to see people changing tires. And uh, for what it's worth, we need a little bit of laughter today. So I want you to write down, what are some of the common causes why you're going to get a flat tire? Well, low tire pressure when you hit a uh, pothole will cause a tire to blow out. Cults of uh, bulges and cuts. So uh, depending how worn your tire gets, and I'll show you a picture of a worn tire in a minute, you've got to check your tire uh, constantly uh, to make sure it's not wearing down to a tread that's not safe. Uh, you can't say the, see the inside tread that well. So it could be wearing a little bit there and that's where you're going to find problems. Oh, wow. How'd that happen? Wow, that's different. Uh, anything that's metal, glass, that's going to create a problem. And we already mentioned potholes. Uh, tire pressure, I want you to write down a few things here. Uh, these are important facts about keeping your tires properly inflated to the right pressure. So check tire pressure on a monthly basis. Tires lose roughly one pound per square inch per month. Um, a nail will also cause a tire to blow out. Don't rely on your car's tire pressure um, monitoring system. Uh, so you've got to take out the old gauge and use it with the tire stem. Um, you can get these at any auto parts store. So pop off the cap, press the gauge on, on the valve stem and it'll give you a reading. When we do get back to driving, I do have one in the car, so we can take a look at that. Uh, know your specs. Remember we talked about finding tire pressure on the side of the door. So that is the best way to find what your tire pressure should be. But if you want to check on the sidewall, that also will give you the tire pressure. It's just a little bit harder to see because it's just kind of raised up just a little bit. Um, Newer car tire pressure on um, the door frame, as I said. And then the last thing is your owner's manual will allow you to see what your tire pressure is. There's a picture of a worn tire. So as you can see to the right of the tire, it's right down to what we call the steel uh, belts of the tire. And that's not a very safe tire. And that was actually a blowout. So I went to a tire sh uh, store and uh, asked them if they had any tires that were worn excessively and they took me in the back and this is what they showed me so someone uh, was taking either turns too fast or um, maybe the wheel alignment was off just a little bit uh, but anyways they were not aware of it and they had the blow up before they were able to change the tire One day when I was driving with a student, we came upon this vehicle on the side of the road in Dover on uh, Back River Road. And I told the student to pull over. And as you can see, my image is in the back corner. Uh, so I took out my phone and took a picture. The actual rubber of the tire came right off. And if we go around the side of it, they were actually riding on the metal part of the rim. So what I want you to write down in your notes is that when you know you have a flat tire, pull over to the side of the road to the safest place. So what would be a safe place? A driveway, a parking lot, uh, an off-ramp on a highway. If you're on a highway and you're in the middle or the far left lane, filter through traffic as quickly as you possibly can and safely and get to the right side. You should never change a tire on the... Um, left side of the fast passing lane that is just way too dangerous so it's much better to go on a flat tire a couple lanes over to the right than to change it on the left 
But the other thing too is that if the rubber does come off the tire and you're actually right on the rim, you're going to ruin the rim. So in your notes, if the rubber comes off, you're going to have to get a new tire and you're going to have to get a new rim because that rim is machined to a certain level and the edges are right where they need to be. And when you start driving on it, it flattens them out and there's just no way that you're going to be able to salvage that. So rim is gone, tire is gone. But my philosophy, and everybody gives me a hard time about what I'm about to say, it's better to lose a rim than to lose a limb. So think about safety, pulling over to the side of the road. As we saw in that commercials, it is a dangerous thing. And, and all those situations that they showed you are true and factual. People have been known to go underneath, have the car come off the jack. People have been known to try to change a tire and they have fallen, maybe not off an overpass like that, but they have gotten injured by falling into traffic. And then, of course, the last one where he wanders out and gets hit by a passing uh, truck. You have to pay attention uh, to where you are when you're changing a tire. Also in your notes, I think this might be the next bullet that's coming. Oh, man, this is really fickle on my clicker. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, changing a tire. Cool. All right, let's take a look at someone. I, I went to YouTube to find a video because the one that I normally use wasn't available to me when I switched over. So I had to find a new one to drop into this presentation. So I found uh, a person that will explain how to change a tire. Fix a flat tire. If you ever been in a situation like this, you go out to the store, you come back, you go look at your car and you notice, hey, look, I got a flat tire. Well, it's not a fun situation, but it does give me a good opportunity to make a video to show you guys exactly what you need to do. So every step on how to fix that flat tire. And the first step is you wanna get home or to the tire shop. So we wanna get some air in that tire. So let's pop the trunk and check out our three options we have for situations like this. First, we could use an air pump. Second, if your car has a spare tire, you could use that. And then third, you could use one of these cans of air. And if you need to, you could use one of these plug kits right now to plug the tire in the parking lot just in case you're far away from home or from a tire shop. Back at our flat tire, the first thing I like to do is try to pump up the tire with a portable 12 volt air compressor because it's the quickest and easiest method. All you do is screw it onto the valve stem and then you get your cigarette lighter adapter and it plugs right in. And sometimes the cigarette lighter isn't powered unless you have the car in the run position, so do that. And then all you have to do is hit the little on button and then watch the gauge until it pumps it up to where you need it to be. And for a tire like on the Mustang, it only takes about five minutes to go from deflated to fully inflated. It's supposed to be around 32 to 35 PSI. I pumped it up just a little bit more just so that we have some extra air for the ride home. And then all you have to do once you're pumped up, shut it off, unscrew it from the valve stem, and screw the cap back on. And you can see how effortless that was. I didn't have to jack the car up, change tires or anything. That's why I keep one of these 12 volt air compressors in my trunk right next to the spare tire. It'll pay for itself the first time you use it. And they're relatively inexpensive. And I'll link one in the description. So if you don't have one, you could get one for yourself. Now you just want to wait a few minutes to make sure the tire doesn't go flat really quickly because then it's too dangerous to drive. And in the meantime, I want to explain the two other methods real quick. Now if I didn't have an air compressor or it didn't work, my next method would be using the spare tire. If you've never changed a spare tire, even if you don't have a flat, go change it in your driveway just to see the whole process and make sure you have all the tools you need. If you have a spare tire in your car, most cars will also come with a scissor jack and a tire iron. You want to make sure you have both of these as well as a key for if you have any locking lug nuts. Since you rarely use or even check the spare until you finally need it one day when you have a flat, many times it's deflated or you're missing the tools. And if there's one thing that you learned from this video other than fixing a flat, I want you guys to go out there and check the pressure in your spare tire and make sure you have all the tools you need to put on your spare tire. And finally, for emergencies, I do keep a can of sealer in all my cars, but I only use this for emergencies. All you have to do is take the cap off and then this attaches right to your valve stem. And then inside this can is compressed air and a liquid. And when the liquid in here comes in contact with the air, it solidifies and hopefully that'll clog the leak. And it does it does work for small leaks and it will fill your tire with air. But the problem is this stuff that seals the leak also damages the tire so you have to replace the tire and it also makes a big mess inside your tire so tire shops aren't going to want to replace your tire because they don't want to take that extra time to clean the wheel and get rid of all this stuff that solidifies. That's why I use it only in emergencies. It is good for a backup 
but it's the last thing on my list that I would use to pump up my tire to get home. So those are the three main methods that you could rely on, and in this case, it's been a few minutes and the tire hasn't gone down in pressure. If in the five, 10 minutes that you waited, the pressure goes down and your tire gets flat again, I wouldn't drive home. I'd use the spare, that's what it's for. In this case, we're good to go. It should be safe to drive home. And then I'm gonna show you how to plug that tire so it doesn't leak air anymore. All right, safe and sound at home. And as you can see, the tire is still inflated, which means we probably have a pretty slow leak. So now we wanna remove the tire from the car. And you can do that with the scissor jack and tire iron that come with the car if you don't have a lot of tools. But if you have a breaker bar, jack, and jack stand, it'll make this job that much easier. And no matter what jack you use, if you don't know how to jack your car up, you could check out the owner's manual and flip to the back where it'll show you exactly what you need to do to lift the car up safely. So let's get started. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is break those lug nuts loose because if you try to do this with the tire in the air, it's just gonna spin. With all the lug nuts broken loose, now we could jack up the car. But before that, we wanna block off our rear wheel so the car doesn't roll anywhere. Then we could place the jack on the proper jacking point and lift the wheel all the way off the ground. And it's always a good idea to support the vehicle with a jack stand and not just the jack. Now we could finish removing our lug nuts and remove the wheel. Once we have the wheel off, you wanna make sure it's fully inflated so that you have air pressure, and now we're gonna search for the leak. The leak is most likely a nail that's in the tread area here. So just spin the tire and keep an eye out for any nails. And sometimes it can be difficult to find the leak, so I have a little trick, and that's using soapy water. All this is is dish soap and water mixed together, and what you do is you just spray down the wheel, and you wanna keep an eye out for any areas that are bubbling up, because any air leaking out is gonna cause bubbles. And you can never use too much soapy water, so don't be afraid to use a lot. Oh. So Lit Mobile just sent me this solar wireless battery pack. I'm excited, let's see what's inside. And you can see it right there. And that's a perfect example of how much easier it is when you spray some soapy water. I mean, look at that, it bubbles right up, and that just makes it completely obvious to where your leak is. So I'm gonna spray down the rest of the tire and make sure we don't have any leaks. And I'm just making sure the whole tire is coated in soapy water, and then I'm looking for any bubbles forming. The soapy water also helps you know when you've searched the whole tire. The dry parts still need to get sprayed down and checked. So after checking the entire wheel, it looks like we only have one screw right there that needs to be removed and plugged. Now this is most likely our only leak, and I'll show you how to repair that, but before we do that, we wanna check out where the rim and tire meet. On some wheels, there could be corrosion, which could cause air to leak out, so just spray around the whole wheel and check for bubbles. And this side looks good, so do the same thing on the other side. That side looks good as well. And then the last thing to check is unscrew the valve stem cap and spray right in the valve stem and look for any bubbles. And that's another common area that could leak and cause your tire to go flat. I don't see any bubbles, so we're good. But if there's any leaking from the rim or valve stem, you need to remove the tire from the wheel to fix it. Now, one thing to be mindful of is if there's any damage to the sidewall or the shoulder of the tire, you can't repair the tire. It has to be replaced. Those areas are a structural part of the tire. But with that being said, this is the only damage to the tire, so let me show you how to remove the screw and then plug it so it's leak-free. Now that we've found the leak, we're gonna move on to our next step and plug the leak. To do that, I'm using one of these plug kits. It only costs a few bucks and it comes with everything you need to plug the tire. And before we go and remove the screw and then air starts shooting out, we wanna get our plug ready. So we wanna grab our plug pusher and some plugs. This plug pusher tool is what we're gonna to use to slide one of these plugs into the tire. So get your plug, it should be sticky and it should be malleable. So flatten down the end and slide it through the slot in the plug pusher tool. And then once it starts coming through, you wanna pull it halfway through, just like that. With our plug ready, you could set that aside, and you wanna grab your reamer from the kit, set that aside, and then if your kit comes with rubber cement, you wanna set that aside as well, but you don't need rubber cement to do this job. This is just an extra piece. If you have it, you could use it. If you don't have it, you don't need it. It's also a good idea to use some eye protection so nothing shoots out into our face. Now we wanna carefully remove the screw, and this is actually a really tough screw to get to because it's worn down. I'm trying to use my flathead screwdriver to pry it up a bit. Good, and now hopefully I can get these side cutters in there. And now that I got it out a little bit, I think it's better if I use a pliers and just unscrew the screw. There we go. All right, so now I'm gonna remove this quickly and it's out. And then I'm gonna grab my reamer and then I'm gonna force the reamer into the hole and this can be difficult, so make sure you
actual case here. All right, let's kind of bring this back in. And let's go up a few pages here where we left off. So let's get to the bullets for changing a, a tire. So first thing I want you to write down is look for a safe place to pull over. We already mentioned driveway, parking lot, um, off-ramp, uh, scenic area on the highway. All these places are good. Uh, get everybody out of the vehicle. And what I want you to do when you let or get people out of the vehicle, they always have to go behind the vehicle. Never have anybody beside the vehicle or in front of the vehicle. They've got to be back. Okay. And you just like we said with the railroad crossing, stalling at a 45 degree angle. Um, you want them back about 200 feet at that. Well, maybe not quite 45 degrees, but you want them warning other drivers. So write down, uh, put out warning flares, triangles, emergency lights, and have pedestrians or pedestrians, your uh, passengers back at that point to warn other people that your car is coming up just over a hill or around a corner. Set the parking brake. So that's going to be underneath the dashboard where you're pushing down, or if it's between the bucket seats, you're going to pull up on it. Uh, pry off the wheel cover and loosen each uh, lug nut. So you've got to remember uh, left is loosening the lug nut going to the right tightens it. All right. And when you put the jack underneath the vehicle, you want to make sure that it is on the frame of the vehicle. You don't want to do it on any type of metal part that has the paint color of your vehicle. Because once you start jacking it up, it will start to crimp and and um, and it will ruin the side of your vehicle. Now, once that jack is underneath the vehicle and you're and you're on the frame, uh, make sure it's on firm ground so you're looking for level ground. Sometimes it's good to just throw an old piece of uh, oak or maple or real hardwood, not anything like pine, but something that's going to be stable that you can jack the car up on. Uh, remove the lug nuts and keep them in your pocket. That's going to be for safekeeping. And in the winter time, that's also going to keep them warm. So when you have to grab them, your hands are going to be cold and maybe wet and grabbing anything that's metal. It's just not going to be a good experience. They could actually stick a little bit. Uh, screw the lug nuts, uh, lug nuts on until they're snug. And what you want to rem remember with the lug nuts is that you always want to go in a, in a star uh, a pattern. OK, you want to be able to um, go in that 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 pattern, uh, lower the vehicle, tighten the lug nuts and replace the hubcap. He hasn't responded. Let me see. Reload the page so you guys can't see anything. Can you see it now? I think we're back. Someone text me. I'm looking at the text messages. Okay, Luca just did. Okay, gotcha. So um, now you can see it. Great. Well, I'm not definitely, he was really good. Uh, the way he showed you how to change a tire, uh, he did a fantastic job. I thought just linking it in would be, be cool. Um, I also have him doing how to uh, jumpstart a battery, but we're certainly not going to, uh, see that so we'll 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 forget about that okay now everybody's back on so we're good uh skidding is a driving emergency so we're going to be talking about bad weather on monday uh but we're talking about running off the pavement coming back on and if the speed of your vehicle and the weight of the vehicle is starting to throw your vehicle into a serpentine uh, motion like we saw in the video about speed is that you've got to counter steer. So that's when your tires are no longer gripping the road because of the suspension of your vehicle. 
uh, could be uh, rocks, gravel, snow, ice, anything that's keeping traction between your tires, um, contacting the road, it's going to be an issue. But you got to remember, it is a steering problem. It's not a um, gas or a brake problem quite yet. So remember, try to always start to steer. Once you feel you have some control of your steering, then just gentle easing, braking. You don't want to hit the brakes too hard. Uh, and also remember that every type of turn or counter turn that you have, if you're controlling the vehicle, it will get um, better. It, you'll be more in control. If your speed is too fast and you're not correcting at the right time or the right amount, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to probably do a 360. You're going to just spin the car right out and you're not going to be able to control the vehicle and you're going to hit something. Um, I'm going to go through because some of these are old videos that I had that just don't work being embedded. So I don't want to go through a copyright issue again. I don't want that to happen. I'm going to have to make my own videos when I have a little bit more time. Flooded engine, put in your notes. The only thing I want you to understand that this is for older vehicles. It does not apply to the vehicle that you're driving right now. So the only thing I want you to write down is that cars have fuel injectors, which means that the minute you start your car, there's gas that is going to the cylinders for your spark plugs to ignite. And that's all you need to know. But on an older vehicle, you may have to push the gas pedal down a few times and then turn the key to start it. Uh, if you've ever mowed a lawn and, or used a snowblower, you know that on a two-cycle engine that you're priming the engine. It's almost the same type of thing that you're pushing the prime a couple times and then doing the, the pull start. Uh, if you keep on doing it too many times, you're flooding the engine. You got to wait for it to you know, alleviate from the cylinders and then start it up again. So that's basically all you need to know about a flooded engine. Uh, wet brakes, I want you to write down. So anything that is at the top that is a, uh, a category, I want you to write down in just a few notes for you to remember. Once again, this is more geared towards older vehicles, probably more than 15, 20 years old. Uh, when going through a puddle, test your brakes. Do you have the same type of grab, traction? Uh, does it make any noises? Um, does it feel different? If it is, what you've got to do is dry off the brake. So by applying your brake pedal with slight ex uh, acceleration, it's going to create friction on the on the uh, the brake pad and the router. So it's going to heat up. So remember when we took our hands and rubbed them together? It's the same type of thing. Friction cre creates heat. And that's going to dry your brakes. But so test your brakes going through a puddle, especially if they feel a little bit different, a little bit spongy, or you start hearing um, some noises. Um, brake failure. I don't think I thought I had this one lined up, but I don't think that's going to work. So I'll go through uh, what it is. Um, you're hitting the brake pedal and the car isn't slowing down. Okay. First course of action. So write down pump the brake. So we're talking three, four, five times as hard and as quickly as you possibly can. Okay. Use the parking brake, but remember the parking brake is going to lock up your back tires. So if you're pushing down on the parking brake, it's going to lock up the back tires. Then you're going to have to release it. So if it's a bucket seat, your release is on the lever with the push button. And then if it's underneath the dash, it's that pedal, but then you've got to release. So make sure, you know, you're pushing the, the, the pedal down, but then you're pulling on the release when it starts to lock up on you. I like shifting to a lower gear. Always go to low one, low two. In the driver's ed vehicle, we have um, B, which is a braking gear. Uh, it only has one gear, so you're going to be going into that. Use your horns and lights to warn other people that you're having a problem. But once you do stop your vehicle, pull over to a safe place and... Stop your car. Don't think, okay, I got a little bit more to go uh, and think that you're going to put your directional on, pull back into traffic and, and drive a little bit further until you have to brake again. You're lucky that you didn't hit anything to that point. So just stop the car, you know, call for help. And we're going to talk about what to do for calling for help in just a little bit. 
Okay, direct collision course. This by far is going to be your biggest fear when you drive, is when you're going down the road, you're hitting the brake pedal, and it's not working. You know that you're going head on into an intersection. You're going to probably hit a car, uh, T-bone them, or you're going off the edge of the road now because you're fishtailing and you're going to be hitting a tree head on. This is by far the worst thing that could ever happen to you uh, in a vehicle. So to lessen the impact, you want to hit your brake pedal as quickly and as hard as you possibly can. All right. Uh, you cannot remember, you cannot break your brake. Uh, turn quickly, head for the shoulder, but never to the left. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, as we saw in the first video, the first week of class. Whatever it takes for you to get out of a crash, you should do. But the thing you've got to remember is that if you're crossing the center line, okay, there's a good chance that if you have a crash, they're going to say you're at fault. Even though you're trying to miss things, pedestrians, potholes, you're crossing the center line, you hit something, you're on somebody's uh, side of the road, and they're going to find you at fault. But at times, someone's distracted, they're coming to your side. Maybe if you hit a hard left, you know, that's going to get you out of the direct collision path of travel and get you out of the way. So we definitely want to do that. Uh, side swiping things is important. This will reduce the impact and the chance of injury. Uh, where is this going to happen? Uh, probably when you're running off the pavement and you're trying to come back on. The thing I want you to write down in your notes is when you side swipe things, think of things that will break away. Don't hit things that are immovable. Telephone poles, you know, trees, those are not good things. Bushes are okay. Mailboxes are good. I wouldn't do a fire hydrant, although you're going to snap it off its mount. Uh, I believe the cost of replacing a fire hydrant is close to $10,000. So remember, write this down. Anything that you hit, you need to repair. So that's really important that um, you have a dollar sign kind of in the corner of your mind as you're thinking about what you're going to hit and sideswipe. And the last one that they have here is to speed up quickly to avoid the hazard that's about to hit you from the side. And this is what you want to write down. Where is this going to happen? Probably in uh, parking lots where cars are coming out of parking spaces. And of course, any intersection, any side street. So you're looking at the rotation of the tire as it's coming to the intersection. Do you see that it's stopping at the stop line? Or is it still continuing on into the intersection? If it looks like it's going beyond the stop line, then you're changing your position, you're braking, and then, uh, or in this case, you're speeding up where you think the, the point of contact is going to be, and you're going to try to try to get right by it. These are all videos that I would have shown you uh, if we were in class. Uh, never try to hit, uh, to get hit on both sides. This was a picture from USA Today that I found where a man was pinned between um, two semi-tractor trailer trucks. Yes, he is still alive. Yes, uh, right there in the middle, uh, you can see his face. He's actually looking at you. Um, why someone took his picture here, I don't know. Could be an EMT. It could be a bystander that has called the police and waiting for somebody, reassuring him that he's okay. Uh, maybe filming him to get information that he wants to talk to his relatives that he's okay. I don't know, but uh, he certainly is lucky. Uh, vehicle overheating. So write this down. We talked about checking your gauges when you drive. So constantly when you're looking at your instrument panel, you're going to always keep an eye on your temperature gauge. Remember, C is for cold, H for hot. They're going to have a little red area where you're starting to overheat. So once you see that needle starting to get close to that red area on the gauge, you're overheating. So pull over to the side of the road, turn off your engine. It could be a uh, uh, coolant leak. Remember, if you're going to check your engine and you raise the hood, there could be steam or smoke. So be careful when you lift the hood. And if you ever think about loosening the cap, don't do it. So write that down in your notes. Never loosen the radiator cap because it's under pressure. So when you loosen it, it's like a can of um, soda that uh, it, 
once you loosen the cap, it's going to spray all over the place. So when you loosen the cap, the steam, it's going to actually burn your, your, your wrist. And, and actually the skin would probably come right off your, your arm because a steam burn is, is much, much worse than actually holding your hand over fire for a short period of time. Steam is, is horrible. Um, call for help. And once again, we're going to talk about that a little bit later about calling for help and who do you call. Uh, causes for overheating. Like I said, it's probably a, a, a leak in the line. Um, maybe you've let the uh, coolant get down to an unsafe area. So make sure that when your car is inspected, they check and make sure that you have enough uh, coolant in your vehicle. This doesn't happen that often. A vehicle plunging into water um, in New England, it's not uncommon for people to bring their vehicle out onto a lake or pond to do ice fishing. Uh, in some parts of New Hampshire, we do ice uh, races and just for the heck of it sometimes people just bring their car out onto the road uh, in the winter time I know that I did when I was in high school uh, but be very very careful because it you know around the edges especially when there's a current the ice may not be as thick so you could break through the ice could the vehicle go off the edge down into a ravine into a river or something it's possible but normally you're driving into it. So the, the weight of the vehicle and the, the, the water, you're not going to go right in and sink right down. It's going to be a gradual coming into that water area. I guess going over a bridge would probably be the worst. Remember the car floats for a little bit. It will always go nose first. So try to get to the back of the vehicle. That's where they're going to have air pockets. Um, it's better to be in your seatbelt. If you're not in your seatbelt, there's always a chance that when you go off the edge or go into the water, you could be away from uh, the door to open it up. You may have hit your head and have become unconscious. Uh, so it's better to be in your seatbelt, uh, better chances of getting out. And the other thing too, is that when the car is getting submerged and if it's very, very dark and you can't see, uh, if you can see a little bit that the air bubbles that are coming through your mouth, if you're blowing out air or through your nostrils, that air bubbles will always go up. So when you uh, break through a window or try to open up the door, which will be difficult because it's under pressure. So try to break the window or open the door as quickly as you possibly can. But remember, air bubbles are going to always go to the surface. So look where the bubbles are going and try to always go that way. If you think the car is flipped over and you don't know which way is up, that's the best way to do it. Uh, look for anything to break your window. Um, some cars sell emergency kits where you can actually buy something that's going to pop it. Uh, why can't you open the door? Uh, because it's under pressure. If you think about it, Natalie, is if you've ever been standing in water and you've tried to move your arm, you can't move it as, as fast or as fluid. So the same thing is happening with the door. It's under that pressure. So crack the window Water will come in quickly, but then you're going to be able to push out. Uh, the other thing, and I can't show the video. I'm so afraid now of uh, copyright. Some of these smaller videos should be okay. Um, but if you can actually make a, uh, a vest, a life preserver vest with your pants, if you were to take your pants off and tie them into knots on the pant side and then take your hands and grab the top where your belt is and crunch it together so just throw it over your head you know hold it together it will actually balloon and it will act as a life preserver kind of learned that when i was a lifeguard um oh here's a car that went off a bridge uh it's not going to sink but it is going to have water come in the driver may not be able to get out of the driver's side, is going to have to go through the passenger side. So that uh, is something that could happen. To uh, I like interjecting stories of people that I know. Uh, this is a person that I knew. They went to the same church that I uh, attended when I was in, in Rochester. And, and this girl, uh, I believe she was 11, yeah. She was 11 when her dad and her twin brother were on a lake and their SUV went through the ice. And they had a type of vehicle 
that they were in the back seat and they had to push the front seat forward to get out. It's one of those uh, SUVs that, you know, bigger front door, only one door. They weren't two doors on each side. And if you look at the article, it says that she was trapped in the freezing water for about 40 minutes before rescuers were able to get her out. Now, I don't know if the whole time whether she was submerged underwater, but she was in the cold water and she wasn't able to breathe for a period of time. Uh, the only way that she could communicate, um, you can tell her hand is, is spread open, is that she could only point to a uh, alphabet board. And that's how she's communicated until the time of her death. A real sweet girl and a very nice family. Headlight failure, turn on your turn signals or emergency lights. They may uh, give you just a, enough light to guide you off the road. So we're talking about your parking lights, your emergency flashes. Use them to guide you off. I always like uh, dimmer switch. What they're talking about here is your high beam, low beam. It's okay to drive with your high beam on till there's cars coming, but then you got to go down a low. But if you've got one of your low beam lights out, maybe you'll aggravate people till you get home by just going high beam so you can see both edges of the road really, really well. I'll pull off to the side of the road. I like carrying an extra pair of headlights or bulbs in my car in case it goes out. Uh, remember, you can get pulled over for this, but they usually give you a, what they call a DOT tag, which is a five-day uh, period to get it fixed. If you get pulled over again after that five-day period, whatever the fine was supposed to be, it will now be enforced. So just remember that. Uh, gas pedal stuck. Uh, keep your eyes on the road. Shift to neutral. Okay, never look down. Never go down to do it. A lot of times it could be the mat that is being pushed where your foot is, the mat is getting pushed up against the gas pedal and it's not releasing when you let go of it. Uh, pull over to the side of the road to do this. Don't do it while you're moving. Uh, stop the vehicle and turn it off. Uh, turn it back on again. Cause a lot of times, a lot of problems with your vehicle could be computer related. So there is a malfunction with the computer, just like the computer that you're on doing your work, is that you get that spinning wheel. Maybe there's something going on with the car's computer. So by turning it off, it resets it, and it, it tells you whether the problem is persistent, and it's going to need someone that's real mechanical to fix it because the way cars are now, that most people can't do most of the work that they need to do to, to fix a vehicle. So call for help, and like I said, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, I don't see if I throw this on, let's see if this works. I'm going to go back up, up here and see if this works. Although it is a rare occurrence, your Toyota may experience a sticky accelerator pedal. You should pay attention to the operation of your accelerator pedal. If the accelerator is harder to depress than normal or slower to return, it may be a precursor to a stuck pedal. These vehicles should be parked and the dealer immediately notified. Okay, what should you do if your accelerator pedal sticks? Although it is a rare occurrence, we thought you should know what steps you should take in the unlikely event that it did occur. If your pedal sticks and won't return to its original position when you take your foot off of it, step on the brake with both feet using firm and steady pressure. Don't pump the brake pedal as it will deplete the effectiveness of the brakes. Then simply shift into neutral, that's N for neutral, and firmly apply the brakes to make a controlled stop on the side of the road. If your Toyota's transmission has a notched shift gate and you're driving in sport mode, step on the brake with both feet using firm and steady pressure. Simply nudge the shifter to the right into drive, D then forward into neutral, N, and firmly apply the brakes to make a controlled stop on the side of the road in a safe area and shut off the engine. Drivers who cannot put the vehicle into neutral should turn the engine off. This will not cause a loss of steering or braking control, but the power assist to these systems will be lost. If the vehicle has an engine start, stop button, firmly push the button down for at least three seconds to turn off the engine. Do not tap the start and stop button. 
If the vehicle has a conventional key ignition, turn the key to the accessory position, or ACC, to turn off the engine. But do not remove the key from the ignition as this will lock the steering wheel. If you experience any issues with your accelerator pedal, please contact your dealer without delay. If you are not experiencing any issues with... Let's go back. Although it is a rare occurrence, your Toyota may experience a sticky accelerator pedal. I think I lost the PowerPoint and I've got to go all the way back to the beginning. So I've got to get all the way through all these really quick. Yeah, Toyota had a real problem with uh, stuck gas pedals. And the thing that people weren't remembering to do was to shift it into neutral. So make sure in your notes, the first thing that you want to do, you're letting go of the accelerator, but it's still going fast. Put it to neutral. You're still going to be able to brake, but the engine is going to not be propelling you forward. It's not going to move you forward. So it's neutral and then brake. Power steering failure. Um, you had this in your reading. Uh, this isn't usually a common problem for vehicles. Uh, if it does happen, and I don't think I've ever had a car uh, have a power steering problem. I've had brake problems, but never power steering problems. Uh, grip the steering wheel firmly because it's, you don't longer have power steering. So everything is going to be a lot harder at lower speeds. At higher speeds, it's not going to be quite as noticeable. Uh, when you stop the vehicle, you're going to have to use the brakes pretty hard because they may have a connection or a relationship to the power brakes, and that's going to make stopping a little bit more difficult. As we said before, restart the engine, see if the computer cook, kicks back in if you still have the problem. Uh, hood flies up. This doesn't happen that often. Uh, usually it's when you've checked your oil and you've lifted up the hood and then you're bringing it back down. It doesn't latch with this, the safety mechanism uh, to keep your hood down. So there's going to be a little bit of, uh, of a gap. So when you're pulling away from the gas station and you get up onto the highway, the wind is going to be coming and going into that little quarter of an inch, half an inch area. And then the, the hood is going to fly up. And of course, that's going to take you by surprise. You're not going to be able to see and who knows what's going to happen. So if you can regain your composure when the hood flies up, what you want to do is just kind of sink down a little bit, you know, kind of look underneath where there's a gap between your hood and the, um, and the dashboard of your vehicle. Let's get this back up. It's amazing. I can do everything here without tipping everything over. Um, I guess a last resort would be to tip your head out the window. That will kind of guide you uh, to get you in the next, you know, 60 to 100 feet off the road. Uh, and remember, the window may shatter. Um, it won't break through, but it will crack and shatter. So it's going to be difficult to see and look for a safe place to pull over. Um, that was a video. We've already talked about railroads. Windshield wiper failure could be a fuse. It may not be. We're not talking about the blades coming off, although that is a problem. So make sure that you always have a good uh, edge to your blade uh, to keep your window uh, clear. Uh, if it starts to get a little bit worn, you will start seeing streaks in the winter and the, during a rainstorm that's telling you you've got to replace your blades. Another thing, too, is take some alcohol and a cloth and clean the blades to keep them clean. Um, well, be careful with alcohol. It may dry out the rubber, but you you want to clean the blades so it has a nice edge because a lot of times dirt and debris will start to form on the edge of the blade. Uh, once again, stick your head out the window if you can't see that well and guide yourself off the road. Just like with the bulbs, I like to carry an extra pair of bulbs in the car just in case, I mean, blades in the car like I do bulbs, just so that, because um, a lot of times when things break, it's at night and everything is closed. 
like even right now, you know, you may not find a place to get bulbs or, or blades. So I always like carrying an extra in the car. It's just a safer thing. And uh, keep uh, snow and ice off the blade. We know it's important to keep snow off the hood, the trunk, and the roof of a vehicle, but also on the blade, it's going to start to accumulate. So we want to keep that, keep that safe. Uh, need to know this for the final pull off the road for at least 200 feet so people see you. So if your car is disabled, uh, never park on a hill or a curve because people aren't going to see you as, as you they start to come um, around. Use your parking lights and your emergency lights to um, warn people. Uh, let's just talk about that right now. So in your notes, what I want you to write down, parking lights should be used when you have a situation and you know that you're going to be able to control it. You know what to do. You have the items, like we said, wiper blades, bulbs, whatever. Uh, you know how to change your tire. It's going to be your parking lights. Your emergency lights basically is an indicator that you need help. Now, if you need help, the police will pull over. If police see flashing lights, they're going to pull over and see what they can do to help you out. If you pull over to the side of the road with your parking lights on, they're going to probably just keep driving by you because they're thinking you're looking at your phone to do a text message because you're not going to do it while you're driving. That's illegal. You're not supposed to do that. You could be looking for directions. Um, you may not feel well and you just want to pull over, regain your composure. But uh, emerge, uh, your emergency flashes will cause people to pull over. We're going to talk about that in a moment. If your car has no electrical power, so you can't use your parking lights, your emergency flashes. So remember, write this down. Final's coming up in two weeks. Uh, a red cloth is universal of a car that's disabled with no electrical power. You use red in the wintertime because you don't want to blend in with the snow if it's snowing. So white during spring, summer, and fall, red in the wintertime. Stay with your vehicle till help arrives, okay? And put flares, reflectors 200 feet behind in the front of your vehicle. So let's just stop here with uh, stay with your vehicle. So I want you to write this down. This is not in your textbook. Uh, this is not in the state manual. This is something that you should do as a young person, okay? Stay with the vehicle because you do not want to be walking on a road that's unsafe. But before you get out of your vehicle, you've put your, let's say you've put your parking lights on or your emergency flashes if it's something that you're going to deal with, like changing a tire or something. Um, text somebody what has happened. Okay, write that down. First thing, look for a safe place to pull over. Then second thing is to text somebody what has happened. I've got a flat tire. I've run out of gas. Um, the brakes aren't working right. Okay, so text somebody. If you have Find My Phone, that should be activated the minute you get your license. The minute, okay, you go for your license, you should have a way that your parents can use GPS to know where you are. Okay, that's that's a must. Now, the other thing, and I'm going to put my phone in my pocket. I'm pointing the camera out. You can still see the camera pointing out a little bit. If you're going to leave your vehicle, and you're going to be walking around it to change a tire, to do anything, okay? Especially females. I want you to put your camera on video while you're doing the work around your vehicle. Why? Just in case anybody stops to help you, you're going to have a picture and audio of the person that is helping you. Most people don't think about this. If if, if someone pulls up behind you to help you, and let's just say that it's around 7, 8 o'clock at night and it's on a fairly quiet road, rural area, who's to say that that person is on the up and up and that they're there really to help you and nothing's going to go wrong, okay? This is why it's important to stay in your vehicle, call for help, call your parents, but if you do go out, you want a record of people that are coming towards you or the vehicle. Because right now, if my phone is on and a car is pulling up, it's getting probably their license plate. And they may just pull away, but at least you've got a record of, you know, that guy was kind of shady. And then when he saw my phone, you know, 
or I got back in the car and that scared him off, you can warn other people. So that's very important that you remember that if you're, you can't move now, that's, what are you going to do? Okay. Stay with your car, um, lock the doors, uh, call for help. So I'm going to put this, I'm going to go back to a different screen. Actually, I'm going to go through the rest of it and then I'm going to put it on the screen. So let me go through this because we only got a little bit more. Okay. Jump starting a vehicle. I wish I could show that last video, uh, the guy that did the last video, he, he's doing a super job. Um, I may have to make a video and, and show this to you a little bit later next week. Cause I, I actually have a vehicle out my driveway right now that is, um, has no power and needs to be jumped. So maybe I will do a video of it and I'll show it to you later next week. But this is what I want you to write down. Okay. The bad vehicle, lift the hood up. All right. The good vehicle that's going to help you out. They've got jumper cables. Remember that positive is red. Negative is black. So the plus sign is positive. The negative sign is black. You're going to be taking, uh, make sure the vehicles are far apart. They're not, not too close. They don't want to be touching. You're going to take the red terminal, okay, on the jumper ca cable and hook it to the battery of the good car. And then you're going to go to the stall car with the bad battery and put it on the red positive terminal. Then you're going to go back to the good car and attach the negative, the black lead of the jumper cables. And then you're going to go back to the bad car, or the stall car, and you're going to hook it to the frame of the vehicle, something that is metal. Some people will still put it onto the terminal, the negative terminal, but you've got to remember there's a chance that it could spark. If it sparks, it could ignite gases and there could be a battery explosion and that's not going to be good. So you're a little bit safer if you just attach it to something that's metal on the, the bad vehicle. You're going to have the person in the car that's helping you out in the good car. He's going to accelerate his vehicle while he's in park to give the car a little bit of juice, to ju uh, juice up his battery, give it a little bit more power. And then you're going to turn uh, the key on the ignition of your car until it turns over. Now, if it starts right up, you know it's a bad battery. So keep them connected for, you know, five, 10 minutes, the longer, the better. But I would go to any auto body shop and see if they could test your battery or even um, a place like AutoZone or Pep Boys or any um, auto supply store will have a, uh, a tester that will give you some idea whether you have a bad battery because you may want to get it replaced depending on how old your car is. But I'll kind of dive in a little bit deeper when we... Uh, when I do the video, but I, I, I don't want another uh, video showing copyright uh, problems. So we'll do that. Vehicle on fire. Uh, it's usually because your car has been hit. And when your car is hit, um, there could be gas that leaks around, could be coming from your vehicle or the other vehicle. And if, like we were just talking about with batteries, your car does have electrical system. So there could be some sparking or arcing. Uh, taking place with the vehicle, and if that ignites with gas or oil, then the car is going to catch fire. Um, so the minute you um, smell smoke or see smoke, you want to pull over to the side of the road. Uh, remember to get everybody out of the vehicle, get 200 feet behind. We talked about setting out flares and stuff like that. That's really important. The one thing you do not want to do, okay, uh, besides getting everyone out of the vehicle, do not pull your car over to the side of the road near a gas station. That's crazy, okay? You would think that people would have enough sense, but they're so nervous because they smell smoke or they see a flame and they just think, I gotta pull over to the side of the road. They don't think about what they're pulling up into. So don't pull into a gas station and do not pull up next to another vehicle because if your car does get inflamed, the closer you are to another car, you are passing that flame on to the other car. So don't do that. Um, I don't like that last bullet. This was in the old manual. They don't have it in the new manual. You're not going to save your car. So no fire extinguisher, no blanket, nothing. Get out of it. Let it go. Um, that's it. I'm going to show you. There was a, um, an attorney that did something with um, gas fires with cars. So I'm going to throw that on. Hello, this see, is Todd Tracy from the Tracy Law works. Firm in Dallas, Texas with another Todd Talks. Today I want to talk with you about the concept that vehicles should never catch on fire following an accident. So why does a vehicle catch on fire following an accident? Well, first of all, if the fuel tank is breached, 
because of a rock, because the drive shaft explodes, because the drive shaft actually uh, moves over and, connect, and contacts the fuel tank, that can cause a hole in the tank which can cause a fire. The second, time, the second type of accident that we see when a fire occurs is when a fuel line actually moves over because the engine has shifted over. Um, there's usually six to eight inches of extra uh, fuel line space. However, if you get involved in a frontal offset impact or what's commonly known as an oblique impact, the engine can shift over 12 inches and if the fuel lines separate, that can cause a fire. Lastly, we see a lot of impacts where the impact is uh, on the outside of the frame rails um, where the batteries are located. And as the impact occurs, the battery actually gets contacted. The, the acid in the battery literally catches on fire and catches the entire engine compartment on fire. If your client has suffered burn injuries or they've suffered death because they were in Okay, let's go back uh, to this. I said there was one last thing that I wanted to, to show you. Okay, this is it. Any emergency that you have and you need to call for help. Okay, probably your first call is going to be to your parents. Okay, that's smart. But the other thing is if your parents don't know anything about vehicles, they're going to have to call somebody. What happens when you can't get a hold of your parents? Now, I... I'm a member of AAA. I'm not getting any type of a kickback uh, because I'm mentioning this. Sometimes even your insurance company will provide you some type of um, auto service uh, in case your car breaks down. So take a look at what your insurance company offers you. But I would definitely look at getting some type of plan uh, so that if you do break down and you need help, that they will come out bring you gas to tow your vehicle, jumpstart your car. So you can take a look at AAA. I'm a plus member. Uh, so classic is 52. Uh, AAA plus is 81 and premier is 109. And I'm not too sure if your parents have a policy, if they add you as a junior member, I think it's around $49. But it, to me, it's well worth it because I'm in the car all the time. But you, you definitely you definitely want to um, have something that will help you uh, if you break down because you don't want to be stranded uh, for any long period of time and you don't want to walk because it's not safe. So we don't want that to happen. So that just about brings us right down to the end of today. Let's get out of this. All right. So couple things to wrap up. I do want you to text me that you are now at the end of the program. I will send you, uh, Josie, I don't know what I'll do with you because you're not getting my PDFs, but I'm going to send you the homework. It's chapter 13. Do the reading. I'm going to give you, not only in this chapter, do the reading, but at the end of each section, there are questions to do. In this um, chapter, I want all the questions done. So you've got all weekend. We're going to meet again on Monday at four to do uh, driving in bad weather. So I'm gonna send the worksheet out to you, but I want the chapter read with all the section questions answered. So if you're staying to the end, you're hearing this right now. Um, and as Brooke mentioned, I have no idea when we're gonna be able to drive. Um, I guess if your parents are okay with it, uh, you can text me and maybe we can do some driving. Um, Tomorrow, it's going to be a whole week that I haven't driven with anybody. Uh, so I would like to at least do some so we can do that. Um, and we're going to finish up the rest of the program just online. I'll try to do a better job with the videos. I think today was kind of iffy coming in and out. So we'll do that. And um, we'll talk to you guys on Monday at 4. So we'll see you.